Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Couple of Nukes. As always, I'm your host, Mr. Whiskey. And if you didn't catch the last two episodes, and they're not required for this, this is part three of this week's Suicide Prevention and Awareness Series. For those of you who don't know, September 8th to 14th is National Suicide Prevention and Awareness Week. And the previous episodes, we had breathwork detoxing and kind of internal healing. In the next episode, we had a faith-based, outward, God-seeking approach to healing. And today, we'll definitely be talking about de-stressing and healing patterns that we've observed from our guests. But we'll also be focusing on suicide within active duty military members and veterans. It's a topic we've addressed before and something that is all too common, an epidemic, really. When Douglas Brinker came on my show, he said the the big number is 22 a day, but some stats show upward to, to 40. And the stats he gave, it's about 40% increase in women's suicides by firearms in the past year. So the numbers are, are, are not in our favor. And so talking about this stuff is one of the best ways to bring it to light, to get people in contact with one another. And so we have Mr. Scott Deluzio, host of the Drive On podcast, and he works with veterans and through his personal experiences and with his guests, I know for a fact, just from the few military members that I've had on my show, it is a topic that is almost inevitable, unfortunately. Whether everyone who served or everyone who knows someone who served seems to know about an active duty or a veteran suicide. So Mr. Scott Deluzio, before we dive into all that, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey? Yeah, sure. And first of all, Thanks for having me on the show. I'm really appreciative of the topic that you're covering and, and the amount of attention that you're giving to it. But yeah, glad to be here. And yeah, so I served about six years with the Army National Guard. I was an infantryman deployed to Afghanistan in 2010. It was kind of a rough de deployment for, for the most part. We were good. The guys that I served with, we all came back home. Unfortunately, my younger brother also was on that deployment. He was stationed in a different location from where I was, about 80, 90 miles or so away from where I was, and he was unfortunately killed in action. So when we came home, obviously that was something for me. I had a lot of trauma, grief, things like that that I was dealing with, plus a PTSD from combat and, and everything else that we dealt with over there. And I had my own struggles for quite a while and was dealing with all that. And to the topic that we're talking about today, we lost some people who like I was saying to you earlier, before we started recording, we were over in a place where people wanted us dead and we survived and we came home and that's where we ended up losing these people and some friends of mine. And and that's, it's really hard knowing that we're in a place where people want nothing but the best for us. And that's where we ended up starting to lose these people. And, and that it was just really hard. So between my own struggles and seeing what was happening with some other people that I knew personally, and then even broader, seeing what was going on in the broader military and veteran communities, I said, something has to be done here. I can't just sit around waiting for more people uh, to to take their lives and stuff. So I decided to start my podcast, uh, Drive On, and the whole idea was to help people who might just be suffering in silence. They have lost all hope or whatever the issues are that they're going through, provide them with some some help, some guidance, some solutions that maybe they didn't even know were available to them and talk about those types of things and show them that there is hope for them, that there is a better way. And, and so that's kind of how I got to what I'm doing now. I started that in 2019. So I've been doing it for a little over five years now. And it, it really, it's just something that I started because I said, if I can help just one person and keep one person on this earth for another Amen. day, then I mission accomplished. But um, right. you know, over, over the years, I've, I've gotten messages from people like, hey, I, I really needed to hear that message today. That, that episode that you released, it, that's something I really needed to hear. And I don't pry too much and be like, give me the details and all, all that kind of stuff. But right. it's good to know that people are getting the, the help that they need and hopefully finding resources through some of the episodes that, that I put out there, talking of specifically to some of the organizations that provide things that are Maybe not the first thing that comes to mind when you, you think about like a therapy or something, you think of going to a therapist's office and sitting on the couch and spilling your guts out. But right. there's other things that are out there. There's all sorts of, there's race car driving, there's surfing, there's horseback riding. There's all sorts of yeah. things like that, that you can do that can be beneficial. It's just a matter of 
figuring out what's the right thing for you. You may try something and it, maybe it's not a good fit, but hey, get, check it off the list and move on. Try something else. Don't just give up after one. I think that's the most important part. What you said right there actually is because with men already, there's a lot of negative stigmas about getting help, especially therapy wise, especially just emotional vulnerability right wise. And then on top of that, the military adds a whole nother layer of complication to that, a, a whole nother layer of pride of masculinity. And so I think having options other than traditional therapy helps with those barriers going around them, as well as the fact that, like you said, therapy might not be for every man. It might be something else they have to do. Mm -hmm. What you said that really resonates with me is I remember that my ship had set the record for most suicides with, within a year. It went under investigation. We had three in a single week with these suicides. And I'm sure you've seen it with some of the guests on your show and your personal experiences. And I've spoken about it. It didn't matter if they were a, a chief, an officer, man, woman, black, white. None of that mattered whether they were married or not. And I spoke on a show previously. I said, none of that stuff matters to the person who is dealing with suicidal ideation that stuff matters short maybe to the investigators or trying to make a pattern but when someone is feeling like their life has no value that no one would miss them it doesn't matter who they are or who they're connected to and in the last episode and in previous episodes on my show we spoke about eight to 15 people are left behind who are directly affected by a suicide and it, of course depending on who you are can vary uh, even people who felt like they were insignificant, that they had no one, no impact, no meaning. They still affected around 8 to 15 people on average, which is a right. lot of people, especially in the military, you tend to have these smaller circles. But like I said, what you said resonated with me because my ship had all those suicides and they hosted these group therapy sessions. And I'm not here to bash on Navy Medical. I've had a lot of bad experiences with them and so have most of my shipmates. And as far as the therapy sessions went, it was kind of just like a, a share circle. And I remember what really impacted me was another sailor was there whose best friend had committed suicide just a few days prior. And he broke down crying. He was super upset, of course. And what upset him the most was that we were in shipyard, Newport News, Virginia. And he goes, we have lost so many people stateside here and where we're safe like you said that was what hit him the hardest and it wasn't until he said those words that it hit me as well it's like hey this was supposed to be the time of our life most of us are fresh out of high school we got sent to a ship that's in the yards we go home every day we can go out town every weekend we're not deployed we're not actively under fire we're not at the dangerous part yet but we've already lost so many people and when mm -hmm. he said that I think the whole group just got silent. It really resonated with all of us, like you said. And I think it's even worse in your case, having gone there and made it back, we were yet to go and we were dealing with it. So what we're seeing on both ends, suicides before and after deployment, more so than during, which yeah. I think is the scary part and the worst part. And so, Scott, have you seen a pattern? You've been doing this for a couple of years. Have you seen any main patterns among these tales of suicide or whether it was committed or just some of the veterans who have come on your show who almost did and ended up not doing it? Or is, are there any patterns that you've been able to discern? I think each situation is going to be a little bit different in terms of the why or the how or the all, all the questions that, that go around it. Some of the things that you were some of the demographic type things that you were mentioning before, right. where they male or female or black or Hispanic or whatever, all, all the things that the investigators look into and all the boxes that they need to check for their reports and all that kind of stuff that at the end of the day, like th this was a person, I, I don't care right. male, female or, or whatever. It's like, a, it's exactly. a person. That, that's the, the stuff that I'm, I'm focused on. But I think w one of the things that probably is the biggest contributor I would think is isolation mm -hmm. when you just keep away from old friends, family, you're just kind of isolating yourself from the world. You start to feel like you maybe don't have a purpose or just, you're just taking up space, that, that type of thing. And it, it, nothing could be further from the truth, but those thoughts just start creeping in your head because 
there's right. no one around who who seem seemingly cares enough about you and that can start to get those demons in your head start starting to make up these stories that maybe you're better off not being here and so i think connection is a big thing to keep people connected with whether it's family whether it's community a network of people call up an old buddy from the military if that's your thing or call up call up anybody go find if you don't have that group of people who are readily available near you maybe you move to the other part of the country and they're all someplace right. else go find that group find figure out what your interests are what your hobbies are the things that you enjoy and there's trust me there's other people who enjoy those things too and go find them they i'm sure they have groups of people who go do all sorts of different things and get involved with those people now you have a community around you and a network of people who can be there for you in times of crisis and that will actually give a damn about whether or not they see you tomorrow or, or the next week or, or whatever. They're there and, and they'll be there for you if you start making those connections. For anyone who is listening who has served in the military, you know what it's like to have the backs of the people to the left and to the right of you. And it's like, I would literally take a bullet for any of these people that I served with because that's just how tight of a connection that you have with these people. And any one of them would do the same for me. And when you have the, that type of connection, when people care enough about each other, that means that you're caring about those people too. And you don't want right. to, you don't want to let those people down and, and you want to be there for when they need help and, and they need somebody too. And now, now you have a sense of purpose, uh, a sense of meaning, a sense of belonging in, in this community. And, and that I think is, is one of the biggest uh, contributors to uh, keeping people uh, from going down that dark path. Yeah, and it's we kind of got two discussions going on here because active duty and veteran are different discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll start with the active duty side because actually the iso the isolationism is a huge thing. Every sailor that I talked to who was experiencing suicidal ideation that is still here with us to this day, they were all so isolated. They And it's difficult. I understand even me, when you go into the military especially if you were raised in a small town or a strict bubble like I was, it's a huge culture shock. You've got people from all these different states who believe different things, act differently. And the military can be hard to fit into as easy as it is because of that. I think the strongest and weakest part we've always said is the, the diversity and the melting pot culture of the military. And mm -hmm. when you have, when you don't find your place and when you kind of, just see your coworkers, your shipmates, your fellow soldiers as just coworkers, and you don't bond with them past that surface level, you end up very isolated because unless you make in civilian friends, which can be difficult when active duty because you're moving around a lot or you've got demanding work hours and you really need to lean into your coworkers and still have that separation between professionalism and y'all are buddies. But I think that's really important. Like I said, most of the sailors I dealt with that were suicidal, I don't say dealt with like it was a burden, but who I conversed with about that stuff, they were so isolated. And that adds on to that, who would miss me? Why do I matter? If I disappeared, I'm not contributing to anything. And part of that has to do with also the job satisfaction in the military, especially if you're not on the front lines. It's very frustrating to be in, I guess you could call it the back lines, to be stateside doing whatever you're doing. I know a lot of the nuclear operators I worked with felt purposeless. They didn't have job satisfaction because they weren't, they, they, I hate to say they weren't killing people. They weren't seeing like action that was clear that was uh, contributing something. We were running the ships and making sure they were powered and doing maintenance and tags. And a lot of people didn't have job satisfaction with that. They felt like mm -hmm. they wanted to be out there. And so when you have no job satisfaction as well, that plays into the, well, if I was gone, it wouldn't matter because my job doesn't matter. I'm not contributing to anything. But th the matter is, you are. You are playing an important role. And I think they get this mindset, well, there's 100 recruits in boot camp right now who are ready to take my spot as soon as I leave. And that's we're not looking to just replace you. We, you are more than a billet. And unfortunately, some chains of commands aren't the best at treating you like a human. I think leadership plays a huge part 
into yeah. the suicidalness, the work culture, the toxicity of it or lack thereof. Unfortunately, I've seen some I've seen you could take two sailors dealing with the same issues in terms of suicidal ideation, depression, anxiety, stress. And if you put one with leadership that supports them, that helps them get resources, that accommodates them for that, and one that just makes their burden worse, whether intentionally or unintentionally, you're going to have two very different outcomes. So I think leadership plays a big part. And it's important for us as leaders in the military to remember that we are playing a role into that isolationism. You can still be there for them, be a support system for them and make them feel cared for without crossing the boundary of professionalism, without losing their respect. So I think that's really important. And then for veterans, I've seen a lot of veterans having trouble making friends with civilians or transitioning out and they only hang out with other veterans or active duty, which is fine if that's your group. I mean, you are able to connect to those people further. And I understand that getting out of the service, all my friends are veterans or active duty military. And I'm still working on making the military not my life and transitioning out and getting a new identity. And part of that is bonding with new people. And I think now more than ever, it's easier to find a support group because as much as I've bashed on social media on my show, in the past few episodes, we've spoken about how now you can go on Facebook or whatever social media platform and find veteran groups. You can find all the way down to what you did. Like I had an episode about the Marine, the U.S. Marine Sniper Scouts and how all the just for people who were sniper riflemen in the Marines had their mm -hmm. own group. There's naval nuclear groups. I'm sure for Army National Guard, they had their own groups down to yeah. maybe it's people from the same division or whatever it is. And so there are down to the more, most particular groups, you can find people. And I think that helps a lot. So the internet can be your friend as much as your enemy. And I think a lot of people feel like the screens isolate us, that they separate us. But like I said in a previous episode, I've met people online who, if I really needed them to or vice versa, we would go find them in person. We're more than willing to make that trip. And yeah. like you said, that brotherhood and that sisterhood, there are people in the military that I, I haven't seen in months or years in, or even, even if it's a phone call and it's like all that time between us didn't happen. It's like mm -hmm. we're back side by side. And I think we need to remember that. And I think the further away we stay from people, the more difficult it is for us to remember that they are right there for us. Yeah. There was a guy I, I served with. He, he called me a, a couple months ago and we hadn't talked in, in a few years and we picked right back up as if it was like the last time that we were talking. It was just like that. So, yeah, just because it's been a little while, I, I don't think anybody's going to be like, oh, man, I don't want to deal with this guy. Like, right. yeah, pick up the phone and call somebody and talk to him. But a couple of things you, you touched on there that I, I wanted to kind of just circle back to for a second, if I can. For sure. One of the things with leadership especially you were talking about leaders and how toxic leadership can be a problem and it certainly could but leadership can also help in 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 the way that if it's done right if the leaders are leading by example right so if right you have a, a leader in your unit that is maybe dealing with something some mental health problem or something like that and if they just kind of the hell with it. I'm not, I'm not going to go get help and whatever. And they just start spiraling and getting worse. That's going to affect their job and their leadership skills and all that mm. kind of stuff. That's going to make things worse. However, if they end up going and getting the help that they need and let people know, hey, it's okay to go get help if you need it, that's going to make a better environment overall because it's like, oh, well, if he can go do it, then why can't I? But leading by example, I think is a big thing for the leaders. And you also were talking about folks in the, the military who maybe don't have a frontline boots on the ground kind of role where they're maybe more behind the scenes yeah. and, in different capacities. I heard a statistic a few weeks ago, and I don't know how true this is because I didn't verify the source or right. anything like that. Someone was telling me this, but it was somewhere around eight to 10 troops are required for every one boots on the ground troop that that you have so support staff accurate. logistics yeah. and other things that that go into it you need to have like eight to ten folks back home For doing sure. all the stuff we have equipment that needs to get shipped overseas to wherever the 
front lines are, depending on what combat zone you're talking about. People got to load those, load the ships. They have to load the planes. They have to do all the maintenance and repair and get equipment ready to get sent out and all that kind of stuff. That's not a small task. And without that stuff, as someone who was boots on the ground, and I, we regularly receive shipments of stuff, in, by the way, including food. Like, right. <laughs> if we didn't yeah. have that, I don't, I mean, we'd be toast. We, we wouldn't have any, sure. any way to continue working after a little while. So like those jobs are super important. Um, and bottom line, no matter what it is that you did in the military, all of us who have served in re- recent years, at least the last 20 plus years, sure. every one of us is a volunteer. Every one of us volunteered to to go and do it. And we volunteered and the and did what the military asked us to do. And that's something you should be proud of. I mean, I don't care what it is that you did. You filled the role that that needed to be done. And that that was an important task in order to allow people like me who was in a combat role to be able to do the job that I did. Because if you guys weren't there, we wouldn't be able to do our job. Right. You know? well, it's like any system. You could, If you remove any small piece, no matter what it is, the whole system is not going to work. And I think a lot of people don't have that bigger picture view. Like you said, their pride is in wanting to be the main focus and yeah. not in what they're actually doing and the, the overall picture of it. And also you talked about how our word is transparency as a leader goes a much further way and is much stronger. I think some leaders worry if I'm transparent, if they see that my marriage is struggling or my mental health is struggling, they're not going to respect me. They're going to think I'm weak. But that transparency goes a long way. And I have to agree because a lot of chiefs and master chiefs in particular on my ship and just the bases I've been to or the ships that my buddies are on because we all share stories. There's a lot of them, not all of them, of course, we never talk in absolutes, but there's a lot of them that will keep you later because they have an unhappy marriage or their life. They're always complaining about it. But if I was with a chief or a master chief or working with them and they're like, seeking marriage counseling or talking about getting help, that goes a lot further than I I lose respect for a chief who's just complaining. And of course, the Navy saying is you're not a good sailor if you're not complaining, but there's negativity vomit. And then there's complaining with a solution oriented mindset. There's a difference between looking for help or just dumping, just pushing it aside. And I think, like you said, that transparency as a leader goes a long way and it's an example and I've had a lot more respect for my leaders who have, I, they're a lot more convincing to me if they're saying, hey, we've gone through this too, and this is what we did to deal with it, rather than you're a pussy or just suck it up, you're a man in uniform. I think some of my best leaders were like, look, putting on the uniform doesn't mean you don't cry that you're not human. I, I had some stuff I was dealing with at one point. I went through a terrible breakup and it really set me behind in life. And my mentor was like, it's okay to cry. Whether you're in a uniform or not, you're still a human being and you need to process this. Whereas I've had some leaders who would have been like, look, you put on the uniform, there's everything goes away, focus on the job, which is important, right? You still need to focus on the job, but there still needs to deal with that other stuff. And I have a lot of respect for the leadership that has supported me and my shipmates rather than just try to make us stronger by just saying, ignore it, pain builds Mm -hmm. this and that. I think there's a balance to be had. And I think we're kind of seeing some of that transition, but there's still a lot of leadership that has been in for several decades that are still more rooted in traditional mindsets. But we've seen some of that shifts. And one of the biggest concerns, one of my mentors brought it up to me. He was like, Mr. Whiskey, do you know why the issue with the ship you're going to is particularly bad. I was like, well, they had several suicides in, in a year, about 13 and three in a single week. That's pretty bad. He goes, when did they start making changes after all that? So what did they portray? If enough people take their lives, then we'll have change. And it said this precedent. And I, I've even heard some people say, well, we need a suicide around here if we want to get that fixed, or we need, someone's got to take a hit for the team. And that is such an awful mindset that I really do preach against. So I hope to see continually faster changes. I know with the military being such a large system and and David Nathanson, he was in the Marines for over 30 years. He came on the show and he did say something 
that really was a reality check for me, which was if the military is constantly changing continually, we're not going to be ready. And I think there there is an importance to that, that we really are thinking and planning a firm set of events to put in place to enact that change. And that's not something we're going to keep changing. And I think what we really need to see in Scott, I'd love your input on this, is more third party. I know when I was leaving my shit, they introduced more civilians that you could speak to on mental health stuff and more resources. I think there needs to be more third party that is more easily accessible to us. I think that sometimes that separation from the uniform really does help break down that wall of, I don't, I don't trust big Navy. I don't trust big army. I don't trust Uncle Sam with my mm-hmm. emotions or they're going to tell someone, what's your input on that? Yeah, for sure. And I think your point about how the military is just such a big organization, whatever branch you are in, it's so big, it's slow to change. And probably by design, it probably shouldn't be very agile and quickly changing things because when you quickly change things break and you don't want things breaking when you're defending a country. And so there's some degree of logic there, I think, with, with all of that. Same thing with the VA. It's a massive organization and you don't want, and especially there's budget concerns because it's a government organization and they're funded by taxpayers and all that kind of stuff. And so you have to keep all those things in mind as well. So there's, there's some things that they can and can't do. Maybe some of it's even legislation based and, and it's like, well, our hands sure. are tied. We can't do it until this law passes or whatever. So for sure, having third party resources available, I think is a great idea. One thing which we hadn't mentioned is that sometimes people won't go to the VA or to some on base mental health yeah. kind of counseling because they're they're afraid they're going to lose their security clearance or their job or whatever the the case That's may a be. Huge thing. And so, and I get that because certain jobs they have rigorous requirements with regards to that kind of stuff, and it doesn't mean that you shouldn't get help. You don't want to have a pilot who's afraid to lose his, his ability to right. fly, not go get the mental health treatment that he needs because he, he's just afraid of losing his job, his right. career, everything that he's worked for. And then he's flying, he's up in the air and he's like, right. you know what? <laughs> I just got to let go of these controls and I can end all yeah. this right now. And like, that's a worse position to be in. Right. So oh, for sure. Um, so you don't want that either. So yeah, definitely have those resources available outside of the chain of command where they don't have to report directly to your chain of command. And sometimes it's just like, I just need to get over this hump right now. I got this small thing going on and not a small thing, but I got this thing going on. And I need just a little bit of help to get over this, whatever the situation is. So third party resources like that, that, that aren't responsible to report back to your chain of command, I think is definitely a great idea. But also third-party resources have the ability to do a lot more things. They can For move sure. fast yeah. and they can break things and they they can make quick changes and pivots <laughs> yeah. and things like that that the VA and the military are not able to do. And so you can get organizations like I, I was talking before with you that there's organizations that offer like surf therapy there's equestrian therapy, there's race car driving, there's all sorts of different things, even uh, gaming communities, like online gaming, like uh, video game type type things. Yeah. Uh, maybe that's not the best long term if you're constantly sitting in front of a screen like that, but it, it also does bring some sort of community together, pe- like-minded people doing stuff like that. And you get a bunch of people together who are doing similar activities that you're interested in maybe it gets you outdoors and it gets you moving gets you away from work yeah away from work away from the stresses of whatever it is that's bothering you and it can just let you your mind just kind of zone out maybe for a little bit and you can kind of just reset and those things are available outside of the military and there's tons of these resources i can go on and on for hours talking about different organizations that i talk to and some of them they're just small nonprofits and they just want to help. I talked to a guy just the other day and his organization takes people out fishing, you know, gets them out on, on kayaks out onto, onto the water and gets them out there fishing. And part of it is just being out in nature, getting out outdoors, getting the sun hitting your face, not being locked away in your cave in your house or whatever. You're just getting outside and getting some of that fresh air and feeling the breeze in your, on your face and just 
enjoying nature and getting out, outdoors. And sometimes that could be just the type of thing that you need, but maybe that's not your thing. You may, maybe fishing is not your thing, but there's other organizations that get people into gardening or right. uh, painting or sculpting or uh, anything you, you know, think woodworking. Of Any, and yeah. Really, I, I can go on and on about all these different things that, that are out there. And it's incredible that these resources exist. And yeah, absolutely. It's like, why, if, if you're, if you're, Put it this way, if you're fighting a war and you're out and you're in combat and enemy is coming, they're overwhelming your position and you got limited ammo, but you see this pile of chemicals and all this other stuff that's yeah. just happens to be there, right? Like you, you tell me you wouldn't use that stuff like to, to try to fend off the attack, like make, right, a right. makeshift type bomb or something like that. Do something <laughs> yeah. to, to try yeah, to I stop get, I get what you're people. saying. You're going to do anything you can. To, I'm tracking. So why wouldn't you use all the resources that are available to you? I don't care if it's sanctioned by the military or the, the VA or whatever. Who cares about that stuff? These organizations, m most of them offer free services to veterans and service members and their families. Uh, so why wouldn't you go out and, and try some of these things? The big issue that I've come across, Scott, is people don't know these exist. Yeah. Or they don't even think to look it up. So, ladies and gentlemen, your call to action is if you know someone who's active duty or a veteran, tell them to look up just anything for veterans. When I got out and I started doing stuff, I spent a lot of money on stuff that I realized later was free for veterans. And I didn't come out with the mindset, all right, before I do anything, let's look up, is it different for military? But I think when you're active duty, you should and veteran as well, you should definitely look up like, okay, what are they offering? And I think, like you said, you're stuck in your dimly lit barracks room, most oftentimes dimly lit, sometimes there's no hot water, but you're stuck in there and you're not going out. And I think people undervalue going outside, like you said, or these other activities. It sounds so simple. Oh, we're just going to go fishing and, and all the depression goes away. And obviously it's a process, but you yeah. know, it's better than nothing when you're doing nothing. Because I'll tell you what most shipmates and most soldiers and other military people do instead of fishing. They go drinking. They drink like a fish. And they <laughs> or go to strip clubs or just sleep That's away right. time and stuff. There's a lot of wasted time in the military. And undervaluing those activities also plays a role into the MWR. I'm not sure if it's called the same thing in the Army and stuff, yeah. but the Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Services. So many, especially young men, are, are so too proud to to why would I go to the MWR? That's cringe, you know, that, and it's such an awful mindset. And a lot of people that I talked to ended up regretting when they were on deployment or at home port, not going on those MWR sponsored trips or doing those activities. And I think through that, you can find a community, especially if you're active duty and you're struggling to meet coworkers. Sometimes it's hard to meet people on the ship or if you're on army base outside of your division, right? So, when you go to the MWR trips, you're going to meet other people who are also looking to go on those trips to meet other people. And I think that could be a great way to get to know other people around the ship. Sometimes we stay so isolated in our division. I mean, I was known as, as Mr. Topsider almost because I would be friends with all of them. A lot of reactor and engineering people were like, Topside has their life up top. We've got our life down below. I said, no, we're all sailors. And each top side I knew introduced me to more and more. And it was great because if I wasn't getting along with Reactor or they were busy doing this, I had another group to go to. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get clicky in the military. They got their one little click that, and it's fine to have that, but you definitely want to expand outside of that. And yeah, I've even had guests on my show and I've listened to other podcasts. And in fact, I was on Michael Cole's podcast, Your Thoughts, Your Reality, which is resources for veterans and just like scott has his podcast mind there's these podcasts out there that just have lists and lists of resources and and other veterans and other active duty members and third parties who host these stuff and i think the biggest takeaway is if you know someone in the service who got out share with them these resources or inspire them to go after this stuff i found out i'm actually part of like a va newsletter and together we served and they sent me a thing saying there's free agriculture and beekeeping resources. And I was like, I think I want to try that out and try something new. And I think it's especially important when you're active duty, like you said, to get out and do that stuff that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do, especially when it, it, it's free. Because normally I don't have horses or kayaks or any of that stuff. 
and it, it's really great. Now, Scott, how have you personally kind of, you mentioned some of the people you were deployed with took their lives, unfortunately. How did you go about dealing with that turmoil and strife afterward? Kind of, you mentioned the shocking reality was y'all had made it back. So mm -hmm. these were totally unexpected. And some of them, I guess, quite a while afterward, and I don't know if you ever found out the, the whys. When I had the vice president of the Marine Sniper Rifle Association come on the show, he said, most of the times, especially in the military, unless they leave some kind of note, something, you don't know the why. Was it PTSD? Was it personal life? Was it, you don't even know if it was military or not, or a combination. Right. So how did you deal with all of that? Yeah. And unfortunately, I, I didn't ever find out the whys. Um, it, it wasn't. Uh, you know, something that was kind of right. broadcast. It was, it was just one of those things that it, it is what it is. Um, right. You know, and it, it sucks, but this is the reality we have to deal with. And so, so yeah, I never found out those whys, but as far as dealing with it, some of the guys that, that went out that way, who are the, like the solid ones, like the ones that you never would have expected, wow. like yeah. didn't seem like there was any, anything wrong. It seemed like everything was kind of good. And there, there were the, they seemed anyways, like the strong ones that, that things just kind of weren't going to be a problem. So it was like, man, this caught me off guard. And and so right. for me, I looked at, at people like those and those people. And, and I said to myself, like, it, if that could happen to them, then it really can happen to anybody. Uh, for sure. You know, yeah. It, it really maybe not open up my eyes that it, it doesn't discriminate it it couldn't be just about anybody and you may not see it coming either that's part of the reason like I, I was saying before part of the reason why i started my podcast is to get resources out there for people let people know hey you're not alone if you're going through one of these types of problems that we talk about on the show chances are someone else has gone through it too you're not alone and also chances are there's someone out there who wants to help you with with this problem for sure you know, whether it's it's therapy of, of some sort it could be an alternative type of therapy like the ones we were talking about before or maybe you're having financial problems and there's financial people who are out there who can help you work through some of those those types of things there's all sorts of resources available and so on the show i, I try to make sure that we talk about those resources first off but also sharing stories from other people who have gone through similar situations. So that way people know that they're not alone. And then we talk about, okay, what got you through? What did right. you do to do all that? And then now that kind of paints a roadmap for other people. And so I kind of took this as a challenge or maybe as fuel to, to go out and, and make sure I help as many people as possible to make sure that these people know that there's resources out there, know that they're not alone, know that there are people who actually give a damn about them and, you know, I don't care who you are. I don't want you feeling like you're all alone, especially if, as a veteran. I feel like like we need to come together and, and help each other out. But but really, anybody, veteran or not, whether you had any connection to the military or not, it doesn't matter. It, it's such a terrible place to be in. And, and I wouldn't want anyone to just feel like, what difference does it make? What, things would be better off if I just wasn't here, like that's so far from the truth. And like you were saying before, there's like what, eight to 15 people that get yeah. affected by any one person. And think about the ripple effect on that, where eight to 15 people are affected from that one person, but now those people are affected and they have jobs and families and other things that, that now those people have their eight to 15 people who are affected. Not to say that all of them are going to be doing that same thing, but that affects them in other ways. And so now that's affecting other people. And that has a ripple effect that goes out and out. And just think about how much better our society would be if we can just tackle these problems, these mental health problems and these other problems that, that people might have uh, and get it to a point where we all kind of look out for each other and we actually give a damn about each other and not have all this division and hatred and all this other crap that, that we have going on in, in society. And we actually kind of look out for each other and it's like, Hey man, you doing all right? Like I, maybe I don't necessarily know you, but Hey, kind of don't want to see someone all upset or whatever you got going on. Like I kind of care and actually talk to people and instead of sticking your nose in your phone and, 
ignoring everybody else. Yeah. And speaking on that ripple effect, you don't need eight to 15 people. If, if you're someone right now and you're like, I can't think of eight to 15 people, it, even one, one or two is too many mm -hmm. right? and anyone being affected is too many. And what you mentioned actually resonates with me because I remember when I left the ship, I had one shipmate reach out to me and reveal how he had been feeling. And like you said, guy well, wasn't the smartest guy, but he was getting his training done at a, a pretty average pace. He was smiling at work. He talking to people. Would have never expected it. I think it, yeah. and it can creep up on us. Like you said, no one, it, it doesn't discriminate. You might not ever feel it and it might just all come down on one day. I think especially in the service, it's a lot of small things adding up. That old saying that the straw that broke the camel's back, I mean, that, that's what it could be. It might not be every day you're like, I, I feel so suicidal and depressed. It might just be one day kind of pushes you over the edge. And I want to circle back to something that differentiates suicide between the military and the civilian world that you touched upon, which was losing a security clearance, a job position, or, or whatever status. That's actually something I've talked about a lot on my show is the hardest choice in the military that I've had to make is, do you report a suicidal person or a, a service member who is expressing that? How do you tell how genuine it is in terms of, are they going to follow through with it? And what are the consequences if I report it, if I don't? And I think that's a very difficult position to be in, especially the closer you are to someone, especially when you know, like, hey, this is all they have. And I've made both decisions. I have reported certain people and other people I have not reported and they're, they got the help they needed and they're doing great, but it may not have been so great for them if they had lost their status. What I want to say though, and I'm speaking to leadership and to those people, I think it's especially important for leadership to understand this, that leadership working with you is so important to say, hey, you're not going to lose it permanently. Maybe they have to take it away temporarily sometimes. I've seen that. Or look, we know you're afraid that's not what's going to happen. If you're willing to work with them, I've seen it. And again, this is good leadership. Uh, unfortunately, not everyone is blessed with that. But I've seen good leadership be like, look, while you're getting your help, don't worry about this and that. We're not going to take away this and that. But we're going to, as long as you are working on getting the help you need and, and you can prove that you want to be here, that you want this and that you want the help, then they will work with you. And sometimes it's like, look, we know you want to be here, but for your sake and the sake of others, it's better that, that you're not here. Like my one close friend's dad was blown up nine different times while fighting overseas and he wanted to keep going back out and they ultimately had to make the decision. It was not medically sound for him or others to, to go out there. And sometimes with the mental health, I've seen it where, look, unless you get a certain amount of help or type of help, yeah, sometimes they do have to remove you, but oftentimes they will work with you. I've seen people who were temporarily assigned a different job within their division. Like, for example, there was a woman I knew who was going through some mental health stuff and she was a gunner's mate. And they said, hey, we don't want you handling ammo or any weapons for the time being. You're going to work on, you're going to do the paperwork stuff and while you're getting your help doesn't mean in her case i can't speak individually what happened but it doesn't mean that's going to be forever sometimes it's yeah. temporary and some and like you said that would be better than a not getting the help and then having a breakdown like you said with the, the case in the pilot being one of the worst case examples or b getting the help and then not working with your chain of command and, and fighting them and this or that and making an issue out of it. You have to prove you want it, but you also can't be ordering them, telling them, I'm fine. You have to prove it with your actions and you have to work with them. That's and right. so, Mr. Deluzio, before we sign off here, what did you want to leave everyone with? I know we've kind of touched upon a couple calls to action, which was to share the resources and check up on one another. Was there anything on top of that that you wanted to add? Well, one, one thing that you mentioned just a, a bit ago, you're talking about the, the straw that broke the camel's back, all those little things that pile up and pile yeah. up and pile up, right? You got to have a release. Mm -hmm. Those things will pile up if you don't have a release. There's a time and a place to stuff that stuff down and get to work, right? If you're actively in combat and you're 
you're sure. feeling down on yourself and you got stuff going on with your marriage. Well, sometimes you might have to just put that stuff aside because guess what? Yeah. The, those guys are still going to shoot at you. They don't really care what's going on at home. Yeah. And so you got to put that stuff aside at that point and you got to keep going through whatever it is that you're dealing with. But that's not to say that's forever, that you just stuff it down and you forget all about it. Right. And, and you never come back and pick it up. But sometimes you got to take that out and you got to deal with it. Sometimes, hell, guys, it's okay. Sometimes it means crying. Just sit in there and bawling your freaking eyes out until you kind of release some of that that tension. Sometimes it's going out and getting some exercise. Sometimes it's doing something, at being active. Yeah. That type of thing to me is like, once when you figure it out and figure out how to balance those things and yeah, time and a place. Okay. Maybe you don't need to, maybe you can put it away for now while to get the, the job done, accomplish the mission, whatever it is, but know that you got to th- come back and circle back and take it out. But for everyone out there, I, I guess the message I'd like to kind of close on is that um, it, it, the world is better with you here. It's, it, you're not a burden on anybody. If you're asking for help, do a quick flip the script type thing. If that other person, who the person that you intend to go ask for help from, if they came to you and asked you for help, same situation, similar cir- circumstances and everything, would you think to yourself, oh man, I got to deal with this guy? Like, no, of course not. You'd be like, yeah, hell yeah, I'm going to do whatever I can to help you. It goes both ways, guys. It really does. Yeah. You might feel like you're a burden because, oh, I'm this big, tough guy. I'm supposed to be able to handle all this stuff. Well, guess what? Sometimes life gets too hard and you need help. Getting that help from, it could be just from a buddy, just sitting there talking and getting stuff off your chest and letting it out. Sometimes that feels amazing just to be able to get stuff off your chest. Whatever it is that you got to do it, but life is the world is better off with you still in it. And don't think otherwise for even a second. And the, the way that you talk to yourself it really does make a difference. So, so please yeah. believe that what I'm saying is true. Amen to that. And just, you talked about how if we don't release it, it's going to build up. And I know actually some of the Vietnam veterans who came on my show, it wasn't until decades later. But even decades later, all this PTSD, all these thoughts that they had just been burying for years and years, it, it does come out eventually. And typically the the later, the worse, to be honest. So yeah. I, I, like you said, we should be seeking continual release rather than these buildups, a trickle rather than a volcanic eruption, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. And, and when you look at the statistic of the, the 22 a day or whatever the number is that's floating right. around now, surprisingly, it actually tends to be older folks who are in that number more yeah. frequently it's some, somewhere i forget the numbers now it's been a while since i looked at the numbers but it was somewhere i think around like like 60 70 percent of the people were in kind of like the vietnam era generation yeah. and so yeah if you let that just fester over decades like that what, what do you expect it's, it's going to be that volcano that erupts in a massive yeah. way as opposed to just slowly letting it out t- over over time like man it doesn't take more than like five minutes just let it out go punch a pillow scream in a pillow do whatever get, you got to get the things off your chest go talk to somebody whatever but do that over time don't let these things build up into one big enormous thing and then i think that that's kind of the message that that i hope folks will take away yeah, and honestly, I want to preach a bit of gratefulness. Yeah. Those older folks who are taking their lives, they didn't have access to all the resources that we have nowadays. Honestly, it is one of the best times to be a service member or a veteran because of the access you have to the internet and all these programs that have been made. So please take advantage of it because there was a lot of people we've lost who weren't able to. So re- please be grateful for that. But yeah, Mr. Deluzio, thank you so much for coming on and talking about this. It's not an easy topic to address and not one that everyone wants to talk about or listen to, but it is important, like you said, that we spread that message of love, of human connection, and of resources. So thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, in the description below, you'll definitely find some of those resources as well as Scott's show, Drive On. So be sure to check that out. Sailing through the ocean blue Nuclear reactors, my crew got in the ship. The stars is our guide through the waves we ride. Jokes and laughter fill the air. On 
this voyage we have to share Working together, side by side As one family we will abide In the heart of the ship we decide Nuclear operators with pride Powering the vessel with every stride Our mission, the source of great pride